I am Marty Wolf from season three of The, the Biggest Loser, and uh, I stand before you today a proud food addict. And um, when I say I'm a proud food addict, I'm, I'm not proud of the behaviors. And I'm not proud of the mental torment that happens inside of my brain on a daily basis. But what I am proud of is that today I'm standing right here in front of you on a national stage, admitting to my life's biggest flaw, my love affair with food. You see, two thirds of this country are overweight or obese. And that number has doubled since 1980. And what's even more staggering to me is the morbidly obese population, that number has grown by 350% in that same amount of time. What this means is our biggest people, our sickest people, are getting bigger and sicker at an alarming rate. Why is this? That's a question that plagues my brain every single day. And here's the thing, I have an advantage because I am this population. I represent this population. I know this population inside and out. So in 2012, I took my best crack at trying to solve some of this issue. And I started a health club in Omaha, Nebraska called Square One Health Club. And uh, Square One is a health club for people of size. And how we define a person of size is somebody that has at least 40 or 50 pounds to lose, but preferably somebody who's really been dealing with their weight for their whole life. But also we define a person of size as somebody who struggles with their control over eating on a daily basis. So they don't have to be surrounded in a bunch of weight to use our club. They just have to uh, struggle uh, with their control over eating. It's important for people to understand that. Oftentimes I get media outlets calling me and they're like, well, why don't you let any thin people in? I'm like, oh, those poor thin people who have no place to go. <laughs> I'm like, you know, this is for people that really struggle with weight and have been beat up by this thing day in and day out, like I have been uh, my whole life. Square One it is different in that it's a, um, we're a for us, by us weight loss concept. It's big people helping other big people in three critical areas. We help them in, in fitness, behavior modification, and daily accountability. Simply put, we're kind of like a weight loss camp brought to the city, in the trenches, under one beautiful umbrella of security, safety, and a like-minded community. You know, obesity is the biggest conundrum to me, especially as the owner of a health club, targeting the population. Because on one hand, we can see our population. You know, Starbucks can't go, we can see who likes a caramel macchiato, they don't know. I can see our people for the most part. On the other hand, what's so invisible inside of our population, when they walk through those front doors of square one, they literally have no clue as to what illness they actually suffer from. Most of them think that they that they, they just like to eat. Uh, I say our population is, is in love with food. So we have a, a really big problem on our hands. How do we help a population that doesn't know how to help itself? If we don't know what we suffer from, how can we find that solution? I often say, I think of myself almost as the chubby whisperer because I feel like I know so much more than they do. I've been down this path. I can almost pinpoint the things that they are going to go through, all the strife and all the turmoil. So as we continue to unpack this today, first what I want to do is take a dive into what it's like to grow up as, as a person of size and be a food addict. And I'm uh, sorry to disappoint you, but the person that I picked out today to examine is me. Of course, my parents, thank you, 
chose to put in blocks under me, chomp. Uh, but this isn't the first time weight had come up. No, no, no. You see, when I was born, the doctor delivered me and held me out to my mom and said, Cindy, you've got a big bone boy. Now we all know. Big bone is a euphemism for this kid's kind of chunky and he has some issues. But that really was my first strike. My first strike was genetics. You see, my whole family is not just morbidly obese, or not just obese, but morbidly obese. And my mom has nine brothers and sisters, so it's not just a small family. They almost kind of celebrate being big. It's a scary, scary situation. This is my upbringing. This is what I have come from. On top of it, there were expectations that I was going to be the big football player in an already obese family. The part that people don't know is I often get judged. Because you know what? Today as I stand before you, I don't look a lot like that guy who stood on the finale scale for the biggest loser weighing in at 220 pounds. But what the world doesn't know is that I have a sibling right now today who's 500 pounds or more. We don't know because they won't weigh themselves. That's what I fight against every day. My genetics. On top of it, <laughs> I have an identity wrapped around being the big guy. These were my senior pictures. These are the pictures that all of my friends wanted. Me with Cartman. I was constantly compared with Chris Farley. This is how I saw myself forever, the big guy. And this is how the world saw Mark, the big guy. And it's circled around that picture just a few of the nicknames that I could think of. So not only did I own this identity and feel this way in my whole life, but that was actually being echoed back to me by the world and the people around me, people closest to me. It was a very interesting situation. I uh, eventually, this identity got so much a hold of me that my license plates in high school said this. You're not reading this incorrectly. It didn't mean to say P-H-A-T. I'm fat. That's how I relate to the world. That's what I did. That's who I was. And you know what? I can actually pinpoint when this started. When I was in fourth grade, I was bold. I remember I, I slipped in mud playing soccer and mud came all over my body. And this kid pointed at me, and I won't say his name. Okay, what the hell, Chris Quake and Bush, he's not local. <laughs> Chris looked at me, he was a real cool kid in school, and said, why are you going home and take a shower, you fat effing pig? And since Chris was really cool, everybody kind of followed what he said. And so everybody was like, yeah! It's like a terrible scene out of a movie to me. Terrible scene. I remember going home and crying and thinking, why am I so different? I felt isolated. I just didn't feel like anybody else. Why can't I just be normal? Why can't this problem just go away? And that's when I really started to own this identity. And that's when I can pinpoint that it really was a defense mechanism. Because to me, it was just easier to project it to the world than deal with the hurt and the cutting of it every single day. The problem with owning this identity, and I still fall victim to it today, I still make fun of myself, I have self-deprecating humor, right? It still is a part of me, and I'll tell you this folks, just because you lose 150 pounds on a television show, your brain doesn't change. You still see yourself as fat. And some days you feel fatter than you ever been in your whole life. The problem with this identity, though, where it caused me the most trouble, is that I was projecting to the world that I was okay with who I was. When really I looked in the mirror and I hated everything that I saw. That's my second strike against me. An identity. This is 
my third strike. This is my dad, Blaine. Uh, he died when I was six years old. Um, my third strike is trauma. Um, since the passing of my father and growing up without a dad, I can really pinpoint this time in my life where um, my whole family uh, probably already had an unhealthy relationship with food, but I can really see after this time where we really started diving our, hiding our feelings and our self-worth in a substance. And that's why I stand before you today and say that I'm a self-proclaimed food addict. Because the behaviors that I have today, not necessarily proud of it, because I can't really control it at times. And people don't know a lot about this, and they're not talking about it. It's not socially acceptable to look to the person next to you at the cubicle and talk about how your life is out of control and you can't stop eating something. But I do struggle with that control over food. To me, food is not just a friend. I have a love affair with food. And unfortunately, I put it above other things that are more important in my life. I admit, sometimes after not seeing my kids for 12 hours, I'll pull through that fast food restaurant and put food ahead of seeing my kids, even though I know my son goes to sleep. And if I don't get home, I'm going to miss it. I'm ashamed of moments like that, where that impulse continues to come back. And this is something that I don't think enough people are talking about. And why I'm proud to be here today. I'm not the only one struggling with some of these thoughts and some of this inner turmoil. My story is just one of millions of stories out there. Other people have had been bullied, had other issues, and um, if only we all could have taken on running, dang it, my gosh, it would have been just so much better, but I just love my food, and that's why I'm here today. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm continually baffled by is when people walk in the doors of Square One, they're normally there to, uh, they're normally there to start working out or eating better, um, and they're almost always there out of negative motivation. They just got a diagnosis, they're tired of feeling like crap, they're never walking the door just, I love this health thing, I'm so good at it, and I want to just keep doing it. That never happens with our population, as much as I'd like for one person, it just has not happened. But what they don't understand is that the reason they are there is a mindset. It's a mindset. I have a class at, at um, Square One, it's called Train Your Brain. It's kind of my own personal and collective uh, mishmash of research. But what makes Train Your Brain unique is that it's the research translated through the mind of a food addict for other food addicts. So it makes it especially topical and especially practical to my population. And from day one, the thing that I set out to overcome in that population is a sabotaging mindset. What every person of size has in common is they have a mindset that has continually sabotaged their efforts. I call it their seed of doubt. You see, as a person of size, as you go through life, you collect experiences. And let's face it, if those experiences went successful, you wouldn't have a problem with weight. The one linear thing through all those experiences, you failed. And for every program that our, uh, our population signs up for and does, they've probably done 10 or 15 times try just on their own on a Sunday night, go, I'm gonna get back on tomorrow, and they fail at that too. So we have this collection of failures. Most people walk through the doors of square one thinking, I'm not going to be able to do this. I can't, it's, probably, it's not gonna happen. I mean, I'm here and I want to do something, but it's probably not gonna happen. So I have to chip away at that seed of doubt day in and day out. That's the overriding message that I have through all of my 20 weeks of um, training your brain class at Square One. You'll also find that our population will continually minimize their issues with food. They'll come in and they'll say things like, well, I just like to eat, or I love to eat. And I tell them, you don't just love to eat, you're in love with food. 
If you're anything like me, you probably place it over more important things. Are you in debt because of your eating? Are your relationships being hurt because of your relationship with food? We know you're healthy because you're here. Are you slowly killing yourself because of your relationship with the substance? They will minimize that, almost like they're in denial. As I continue to serve and help this population, I am, I am, I see that there is a, a gap between a fit-minded or health-centric population, a population that I feel like I identify more with now these days, and a, a person of size population. And I'll never forget when I first opened Square One, people started kind of flooding in. I asked them, I'm like, why are you here today? And the reason I asked them that is because I wanted to kind of validate my own feelings for opening up this one. I was like, you know, for me, it was so personal to open up Square One. It was a club based off of a feeling that I had my whole life, where I felt different and always wanted to go to a place where there were people like me. And I wanted validation. I wanted to know, do other people really feel like this? Is this market really out there? It's a huge chest. A lot of people said it could work. You want to start a gym for people who don't go to gyms? Believe me, I had that conversation. <laughs> but as the people came in, unfortunately, the most popular sentiment that I heard went even above my feelings. And I heard this echo several times. It said, I'm tired of working out next to the skinny bitch. What this tells me, our population is very hurt. Our population is very insecure. And I can relate to this. You see, lots of times when I look at somebody, I go to a gym and I look at somebody who has a desirable body, I believe they're feeling worse about myself. That's not a great place to go to to get healthier. And I can really feel that. And I can see kind of the divide. And it was almost justification for why I felt like a club like this was really needed for my population. Because obviously, we have some insecurities that we need to work on. I call it kind of a reverse discrimination. You know, a big person might sit there and go, well, we're being discriminated because, you know, I have to pay extra to fit in an uh, airline seat and all of the other things. You know, people think we're fat and lazy and all of those other stereotypes. But that big person takes some ownership as well. Because those insecurities inside of them have prevented them from bettering themselves uh, their whole life. I think there are some things that we can do as an industry, though, to better reach out to these people and bridge that gap. And the first one is by understanding it, it, that the enemy is not the body. It's not the body. It's not the behaviors that they show. The behaviors and their weight are all symptoms of a greater issue. More than likely, it's unresolved trauma, like me, and a mindset. And when you understand that it's that mindset, all of a sudden, you have to start treating things a little bit differently. That's where one, I don't put a ton of emphasis on weight. Because really, to me, the, the mark of success isn't that they all lose massive amounts of weight. I've seen people lose massive amounts of weight and put it back on. To me, the mark of success is keeping these people engaged in a year, two years, three years from now. And the amount of people at Square One that actually do that is staggering. I take a quitter population and keep them engaged for a really long time. I know the likelihood of this developing into a lifestyle is all the more likely to happen. The second thing I think we need to do a little bit better to bridge this gap is we need to invite this population into the war room. I think once we understand that it is a mindset that we're trying to go after, we need to invite that, that mindset in for decision making. My wife and I did a ton of traveling after the biggest news, and we spoke to many different crowds about our stories. And what was a common thing that typically happened was we would sit in a boardroom full of what appeared to me as like marathon runners. It was their wellness panel. 
So we would sit with them and they would be like, oh, thank God you're here. Your message is so inspiring. It's great. With that being said, um, we got some folks in the call center who were really, who were really taking on a lot of stress in this company. And um, it, it's a sedentary job position and they're micromanaged and they have to check in and check out. And, and um, you know, it's really quite stressful when they're sedentary. And that's where the majority of our weight population is. We're really hoping your message resonates with them. And the thought in my head is, you paid me an expensive fee to come here and tell them that. Why isn't their mindset represented in this panel? Why aren't they a part of this? I'm going to do my best in this speech. <laughs> Believe me, I'm going to try to pull all the people that I can. But maybe one thing you could do to get this a better lingering effect, let's let them part of the boardroom. Understand that mindset is an important mindset to be reaching. And then the last thing um, in, in bridging the gap between the two different populations in my mind is we have to understand that people of size need their own culture to thrive. About eight months ago, I read a book, so I like to read books on addiction, and there was a book out called Chasing the Screen. It was by Johan Hari. And uh, Johan Hari set out um, to examine the drug war, and he put into question everything that we have ever learned about the drug war and addiction. And one of the research uh, uh, experiments that he came back to is he said, everything we've ever learned about drugs came from an experiment. You guys might have heard of it with a rat in a cage. And they put a rat in a small cage and they give it two sources of water. They give it regular H2O and then they give it H2O mixed with heroin or morphine. And what happened in this experiment was about 99% of the time the rats in like an addictive pattern, preferred the, the morphine water so much to the point that they uh, ended up overdosing. But the scientist is a Canadian scientist. He pulled back and said, well, you know what? If I was in solitary confinement, could they give me two sources of water, one regular water, and one water that made me forget that I was in solitary confinement, I might just take that water. And then he thought, what if we do this differently? So we built what was called Rat Park. Rat Park was a 90 square foot cage, a big room where there were multiple rats. They could have rat families. It was like rat utopia. They could play on balls and spinning wheels. They had multiple kinds of cheese. And you could bet you behind, there were two sources of water in there. The staggering results, only about 5% of that population in Rat Park had what they would even call a preference for the morphine water. Zero deaths due to overdose. Johan Hari went on to say, the opposite of addiction is sobriety. It's human connection. And it was at that point that I realized, you didn't just create a gym. I created Rat Park. I created a place where people who struggle and are oftentimes in small cages and bullied, and some of these people can't even leave their houses for long periods of time because they can't wipe themselves. That's isolated. They can't get jobs because of their life and their condition. And now there's a place for them to go to have meaningful human bonding and human connection and talk about this demon that they have struggled with for their whole life. See, the obesity epidemic, it's not one of the body, it's one of the mind. It's about people who see and experience the world differently. And I think that as an industry, if we don't take time to understand how they think and how they feel, then we could be the ones left behind. I don't think that one chapter in a personal training manual under obesity, under the whole chapter of special populations, is enough to fully understand this population anyway. 
I've seen I even call two thirds of the country special. I would call it the norm. I would call it the majority. My message today is simple. I want to help everyday normal people who struggle. People like myself. A little while ago, my, um, my son Blaine, he's a six-year-old little boy, he looked at me and he said, Daddy, you're fat! And I thought, God, here we go again. But this time, there wasn't pain, there wasn't all the turmoil that I've been through in the past. I just said, you're right, son, I am overweight, but I work hard at it every day. See, it is important to me that my son Blaine saw me as a fighter. Because that's what I am. I'm a fighter. That's my identity. And that's what I think this industry needs more of. That's what I think this world needs more of. Plus size fighters willing to lead the charge and open up. Take that charge. Just normal everyday people who struggle, helping other normal everyday people who struggle to become a healthier version of normal. I'm not here today to give a speech, but a rallying cry. I'm here today to start a revolution, to get this world to see and treat people of size differently than they ever have before. So I'd like to close with the same line that I opened up with. Hi, I'm Marty Wolf, and I'm a food addict. Do you see me differently now? If you do, please pay it forward and bless this world. Thank you so much. Thank you.